chapter 12, verses 20 through 26, that Jesus has just come into Jerusalem on Passover or uh, uh, Palm Sunday. And uh, it is a Passover celebration. There are crowds everywhere. And then you come to this. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. And they said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew. And then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, my Father will honor. Here ends the reading of God's Word. May God add a blessing to it. Here they are again, Philip. Who's here, Andrew? Them. Those people. The ones who keep coming back. They just here last Sunday. Yep, same crowd. They come just about every week. Except, who there is a snowstorm. <laughs> well, what do they want? Why do they keep coming back? I'm not sure, Phil. I know. This must be that same crowd that ate all the bread. <laughs> <laughs> when Jesus spent 5,000 with only five loaves and two fish. <laughs> and then they went home hungry. I remember that bunch. They followed us all over Galilee, looking for more bread, more bread. They're hungry. Our ancestors ate panna in the wilderness. Blah, blah, blah. I bet those did get More than once they started turn ugly, and after six or seven weeks, they started to smell ugly, too. Well said, brother, well said. But I don't know, Phil. I don't think this is the same crowd. Let's see what you mean, Andy. These people don't have that same well-fed and still hungry look. I don't think these people are going to come here to us. Absolutely. These people would be perfectly happy with barbecue meatballs and purple jelly. Pretty <laughs> sure. But if they're not that same family crowd, who are they? More to the point. They want different crowd altogether. Maybe they want other kinds of nerves. Are they even set for birth? Healing service? Hmm. I don't see anyone with crutches and bandages. Nobody's coughing or sneezing. Or turning weird colors might be a good idea to have a healing service anyway. But I don't think that's why they're here. How about breathing? Maybe some of the lost loved ones. Maybe some are lonely or homesick or just want to be with other people. You know what I mean? They might not be here to see us at all. Could be they just want to be together. Okay, that makes sense. Partly, anyhow. But it can't be the whole reason. Can't be that all these people are lonely and they're only here to be with friends. There must be something else. I'm afraid there might be. How do you mean? Well, so far, we've only thought about their needs. As if they had to be here for a good reason, they might be here for a bad reason, too. I still don't know what you mean. Well, suppose they came to show off. Show off what? Could be anything. Their personal personal righteousness to their new shoes. You never know. People might be proud of themselves for being good church people. They might think that choosing Jesus was their idea, and they're so smart for being disciples. Or they deserve the kingdom of God, or maybe they're just here to keep out the river. You're right, Phil. There are all kinds of reasons come to a place like this. And some of those reasons are pretty self-centered. Still, I don't think that's it. I still believe that these people come here as often as
as they do, for a good and godly reason. It's just, what did that reason be? Uh, 
a disciple, this limb. Now, of course, how-to books are nothing new, are they? Uh, videos, all of it, how-to everything, right? I don't know whether Norman Vincent Peale began the craze with his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, but he certainly put the genre of how-tos on the map, didn't he? Since then, we have been inundated with how-tos on everything, right? From how to succeed in business without really trying down to our more recent movies, How to Train Your Dragon. <laughs> but how to be a disciple? Hmm. Well, that is a topic that seems so overwhelming that it seems like it's just impossible to put into a series of easy to understand brief steps. Seems impossible to do it that way, doesn't it? Or is it? Well, in John, in chapter 12, verses 20, a group of ethnic Greeks seek out Philip, one of the only disciples with a Greek name and background. They are likely God-fearers, Greeks who are interested in Judaism, but who have not undergone the full rite of initiation into Judaism, which is circumcision, which in the day was a very painful and dangerous operation for adults. These Greek pilgrims are in Jerusalem for the Passover, the highest of Jews, Jewish holy days. When they arrive, they find the city abuzz with talk about this controversial rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth. Perhaps they were even part of the crowd that welcomed Jesus into town as he rode in on a donkey that day, and they saw the excitement firsthand. And so they come to Philip and their hometown connection, and they tell him simply, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Sir, we would like to see Jesus. The, the Greek word there for see, it means not only sight literally, but also to know, to be aware of, to behold, to consider, to perceive and indeed to experience. How do we begin the journey of discipleship? We begin by focusing upon Jesus, by taking the time and effort to see him, to get a clear view of who he is and how he would have us live life. As Anna said, that's why we gather each Sunday in worship. Many pulpits, in fact, you may not be aware of this, unless you're a preacher, you probably aren't, but many pulpits have a little slip of paper, and, and you probably might be able to tell us about this, report. <coughs> you've been in pulpits that have a little slip of paper, and it's <coughs> sir, we wish to see Jesus. Ours had one, I don't think it does anymore, but it, it did at one point in time, so they took it down. It's there to remind preachers to tell them what their job is. Pastors are here to preach Jesus so that churches can see Jesus so that they then are enabled and empowered to set, share Jesus. We aren't here, as our, was mentioned in our skit, for a weekly pep talk or a political rally or to show off our latest fashion statements or to look upright or even spiritual in front of our friends. No, no. We gather here each Sunday to see Jesus, to experience Jesus, because we need Jesus. Every week we need Jesus. Like Zacchaeus, who had to climb the tree in order to see Jesus as he rode, as he passed by, so we too have to gather together in order to rise above the noise and the hubbub of the crowd that surrounds us, the crowd that we call American culture, the world, so that we can get a glimpse of Jesus, the Lord of life. But be careful. Don't be quite so enthusiastic to jump on this bandwagon of seeing Jesus, because to see Jesus is also to see our sinfulness, our brokenness. When Isaiah saw the Lord sitting on his royal throne in all of his glory, he was filled with dread and he suddenly became aware of the fact that he was one messed up human being. And so he cried out saying, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have what? Have 
have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. To see the Lord is to see our sins also. And yet it is also to see God's mercy as God comes to us in the person of Jesus. Jesus is the grain of wheat, as he said, that falls into the ground and dies, bearing much fruit. The first of those fruits, the primary fruit, is forgiveness. Just as the seraph brought a burning coal to Isaiah's lips, so Jesus bestows with us the kiss of forgiveness and healing. And now, as Andrew said in our skit, He is our Savior, He is our Lord, our God, and our friend. Lord, we wish to see Jesus. As we begin our Lenten journey together, let us make that our goal for the next seven weeks. To help us with the goal, I have printed out about 50 copies of a daily devotional entitled Blessings of the Cross. You'll find them out back. They're like this. There are 40 devotionals, each one for each non-Sunday of Lent. Each one has a brief scripture reading and a devotional thought by Billy Graham, Max Lucado, Anne Graham Lotz, or Stormy O'Martin. Some very good writers. They're quite well done. They're incredibly brief, maybe three, four minutes, something like that. And if you do that, if we do that together, then they will help us see Jesus, to gain a better vision for him and his purpose for life. Please take one after worship for yourself. Grab one for a friend if you would like. I'm going to close with a story about that happened about a hundred years ago. Roger Babson, an American historian, was visiting the president of Argentina when the president said to him, Roger, you're a student of history. Will you please tell me why it is that South America, even though we were actually colonized, even though we were settled earlier than North America, and even though we have almost unlimited resources, can you explain to me how it is that nevertheless South America hasn't made as much progress in civilization and material prosperity as has North America? Babson, the historian, threw the question back at the president, saying, Mr. President, it's evident that you've thought a lot about this question, and I'd be curious to know what your answer is to it. And so the president of Argentina paused for a few moments, and then he replied that he thought the explanation lay in the fact that South America was settled by Spaniards who came seeking gold, while America, North America, was settled by pilgrims who came seeking God. What are you seeking? What are we seeking together? Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Through our actions, through our thoughts, through our prayers, <coughs> may that be our deepest desire this season of Lent. Let us pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, there are many distractions. There are many things that keep us from seeing Jesus. Our busyness, the world around us that clamors for our attentions, our phones which beep and remind us of things we're supposed to do, people who want to talk to us, advertisements, that want us to buy stuff. There's so many distractions. There's so many obstacles that prevent us from seeing Jesus. And so, Lord, we ask during this Lenten season that you might remove those obstacles that prevent us from gaining a clear vision of Jesus. Help us to take the time to focus in upon Him and His plan and His purpose for our lives. Help us like the Greeks to see and to seek out Jesus this season.
For we pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen.